हेलो हेलो एवरीवन वेलकम टू आवर इंस्टा लाइव विद वन ऑफ द मोस्ट रिनाउंड गायनेकोलॉजिस्ट एंड ऑब्स्टेट्रिशियन ऑफ इंडिया डॉक्टर मंजुला अनगनी शी इज अ पद्मश्री अवार्डी अ गिनीज वर्ल्ड बुक रिकॉर्ड होल्डर एंड इन्फ्लुएंसर एंड अ टेडएक्स स्पीकर वी आर ग्लैड टू हैव यू मैम प्लेशियस माइंड टोटली माइ Now let me take this opportunity to introduce you briefly to our club. So Geo Life Youth Club is a non-profit organization which was established in the year 2017. We have been working tirelessly to provide uh, career related counseling and education to the young minds of rural India. We have initiated many successful projects to improve the quality of ed- education. We have a number of students enrolled with us and we are wholeheartedly willing to help more and more. Lately we have come up with this project red dot which focuses on sustainable menstrual hygiene we have collaborated with sathi a biodegradable sanitary pads production company with a twofold agenda firstly to provide eco friendly pads to rural women free of cost and secondly to educate people both girls and boys about menstrual hygiene so now uh, today's agenda focuses on menstrual hygiene and uh, particularly cervical vaccine for that matter so i'll now request you to tell us about uh, more about it and why is it actually important for us and what is the right age for it to be taken right uh, it's a very great initiative for all what you have been doing for the science okay and talking about some is not all cancers are preventable all the the cancerial can be a genetic along different different dietary so many things so what happens is that um you need to um the if we know the cause is hpv we need to block it so it doesn't enter into the body so that it doesn't become cancerous so now we know 100% of cervical cancers majority 100% of the vaginal cancers majority of anal cancers majority of vulval cancers and head and neck cancers are because of hpv so once we know how to block it blocking primary prevention is by giving the vaccine so that's how the intervention of hpv vaccine now we are synonymously calling it as cancer cervical vaccine but it is actually hpv vaccine when is vaccine against the hpv virus now now how we are talking about vaccine against corona virus so once we give that virus now the question comes how many doses are enough when should it be given and why should it be given at that age whenever we give vaccine whether it is polio or whether it is tt dpt or anything we give at an age where immune response is maximum so at birth we give bcg afterwards we give polio at birth then we give at 18 months we give uh, chicken pox so why are we looking at these ages because for that particular vaccine at that particular time you get lot of immune response which is coming so when the immune response come that's how they came to know that between 10 to 12 years of age the immune response to the hpv vaccine vaccine is maximum so if you go, if you give the vaccine at that time the highest amount of antibodies will be formed which will be much above the threshold level so that we don't have to give the booster doses later on so now how many doses we have we have two doses if the kids are being given at 10 to 11 years or if it is later when you're giving a catch up vaccination it is three doses so it is 0 and 6 or later if we are giving it is 0 2 and 6 means you give today after 2 months and again after a gap of 4 4 months you give it so between the 10 years to 45 years we give it so why did we stop it at 45 should we not give it after 45 anybody who is paying who wants to take anybody can take at any age but as a national protocol because in many of the country governments gives it free they had put the upper limit as 14 45 because once it is vaccinated once it, like i said the infection if it's a recurrent repeated infection then it becomes cancer over the years of 10 to 15 years because life expectancy is not expected to be more than 68 or 67 which is the average we cut off at 45 for the free vaccination 
So if anybody wants to take it at 50 years, they are paying, they can always take. That is first point. Next point is why should only the girls be vaccinated, why not the boys? Everybody should be vaccinated. HPV is again gender neutral. It will not decide I will not come to the boys. It can, the penile cancers are also because of HPV infection. Luckily, it is less people who undergo circumcision, but otherwise it is much more higher CIRC. So in about 122 countries, when it is there, many countries have given mandatorily to even boys, like Australia, Canada, it is mandatory for boys. Here, because we expect the cancers of cervix, which is very high, this next to CA breast. So now here we made it mandatory for the girls, but boys again, the choice. So all the educated kids out there, tell your parents and parents out there, Protect your kids by giving the vaccination between 10 to 12 years. If you have missed, don't miss the opportunity later. Just give the vaccine anytime. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. I think uh, it was uh, really uh, insightful for each one of us. Now, um, we had put up a story asking people to drop in their doubts and queries with us. So uh, let's go ahead with some of those questions. First, uh, the first question was regarding the treatment of fibroids. So would you like yeah. to throw some light on that? Right. See, the fibroids are present universally. If you take it on, a, on an average, 40% of women have fibroids. What are fibroids? They are the uh, benign, when I say benign, non-cancerous tumors of the muscles of the uterus. Okay. So when we talk about muscle of uterus, it can be present depending on the location. It can be in the uterus, it can be in the cervix, it can be on broad ligament, it can be broad ligament, anywhere, round ligament. Now, wherever it is, depending on, again, where it is presenting, like either it is next to the endometrium or inside the endometrial cavity or inside the muscle or outside, we call it as submucosal and then intracavitary, then intramural and subserosal. So depending on that, we take a call whether we have to treat or not. Just because it is present, we don't have to treat if it is symptomatic, means symptoms are present, like pain, excruciating pain during periods, or increased bleeding that it is not coming down with simple medicines, or infertility when it is causing uh, 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 infertility that pregnancy is not coming, it is because of this. Or next again, if it is causing the mass, biggest mass in the abdomen and pressing on the bladder, urinary bladder or the bubble loops. So any symptoms are there, that's when we intervene. Now, depending on location, we take a call. If it is inside the uterus, we do hysteroscopically and remove it. If it's inside the muscle, depending on the size and the location, like I said, we do it laparoscopically, go ahead and remove the fibroids. Now, most of the time, it is a removal of fibroid which works. Does it mean the medicines are not there? Yes, medicines do not work. Medicines which give is only temporary for only bleeding to be under control. RU486, which has come as medical management, caused the liver damage, so it is banned from many countries. Next, uterine artery embolizations also does not work, and if anybody is planning for pregnancy, it is not encouraged. Then MR guided FUS is there where focused ultrasound, which will kill the tissue. But that is again for select cases, people who are not thinking of pregnancy, less than 18 number. So all those things are very, very important for us to see. So majority of the time, it is the removal of fibroids, either by uh, hysteroscopy or laparoscopy or open surgery. But just because they are present in 40% of the women, we don't do it. Only symptomatic patients, which we are not getting under control by if it's only bleeding by medical, medical management, then we go ahead and do a surgery. Otherwise, if it's only bleeding, we try medical management of hormonal treatment or Mirena, which is an intrauterine device, which will produce progesterone. So this is how we go about with fibroids. Okay, ma'am. Uh, and uh, the next question which we had was, how much gap is safe enough to plan pregnancy after the second dose of vaccine? You don't have to give a gap. Both are fine. But remember one thing, doing things parallelly and going into stress is not advisable. So if you seriously, seriously think and have the panic reaction, then give a gap of two weeks and plan for pregnancy. But otherwise, you actually do not need. So if you become pregnant immediately, don't get, again, panic ridden and stressed. Don't worry about anything. Okay, ma'am. And uh, 
there were a lot of questions regarding PCOS and PCOD as well. Right. So, ma'am, firstly, please tell us what is the actual difference between the two, and then also explain us about the causes, effects, and the precautionary measures. It is a very interesting question. Somebody read. Somebody wrote their parents with it. Don't mani yandi. Please do not tell parents. No, I am a parent myself. See, it's not about telling the parents. I'm trying to. We are trying to educate the parents because. parents have to show light on how the how to um, distress the stu students or children mm -hmm. if the stress of um, uh, uh, education is coming on the kids the peer pressure is good enough stress of education is the one which is pushing the kids into going into pcos does it mean it only comes for teenage no it can come to any age group any time reproductive age group when again infertility comes stress comes again it comes so the main reason for pcos is stress and stress second reason is the dietary changes and the over body pcos are one and the same previously we used to call it as a disease now we are calling it as a syndrome because there are so many factors which have come three main things which is happening in that is first there's a central hormonal imbalance because of the stress stress induced changes the second there's going to be a uh, insulin resistance leading to obesity and again dietary changes with the one which is very important if not under control they go into diabetes and hypertension and heart disease third which is going to happen is a uh, increase in testosterone levels so this will lead to lot of acne and all the abnormal uh, hair development and all those things so what is very important for us is decreasing the stress when i say stress is the reason de stress yourself listen to music start doing some dance take your time me time is very essential and do whatever you want to do second to decrease the insulin resistance you need to do physical exercise it's not gym it's not uh, yoga it's not walking it is a gym or cycling or skipping or air, every muscle can contract so do the uh, thing exercises or even dance aerobics third which is important is dietary changes decrease your carbohydrates increase your proteins so you do all these things along with the medicines which doctors are going to prescribe according to the need if the central hormonal imbalance is there we give central hormonal thing hormones only will stop the hormonal imbalance so we need to live with balance not imbalance that's important next what is important is insulin sensitizers it's like you know you have you become overweight insulin resistance worsens insulin resistance worsens you are again becoming overweight so it's a vicious cycle which is happening you need to break it so you need to take insulin sensitizers so that you lose weight then you can stop the insulin sensitizer according to doctor's uh, prescription then if you already have abnormal hair go for the waxing or go for the laser but after that you need to go and then uh, then uh, do the anti testosterone this is how it is it's basically lifestyle disease so you need to moderate modulate your lifestyle then medical management thank you so much ma'am and uh, i think at a personal level i could relate to it uh, a lot because i have also had a first hand experience of the same so thank you and uh, the next question uh, was that if we have covid symptoms during pregnancy uh, what medication and remedy can we follow by staying at home right so first thing is there is no ifs and buts it is there or not there so don't delay delay testing especially in pregnancy never delay testing because pregnancy is a state where the covid if it comes it is 20 times more deleterious okay so next thing which is important is covid is a state where blood clots happen and pregnancy is a state where pro procoagulant state where blood clots can happen and if you are delaying the diagnosis and treatment then the complication rates is even more higher so don't self isolate first do the test confirm whether you have it or not now if it is confirmed then isolate be take a video call with the covid physician then take the medicines which they give fever is there it's a symptomatic treatment fever is there paracetamol lots of multivitamin vitamin d vitamin c then blood thinners we give because like i said blood clots are very high then there will be some inflammatory marker tests which we tell you have to do it so by doing all this eating good healthy diet and doing all this and then when you start having breathlessness or fever does not come down when pulse ox is telling less than 90 or you walk little and you get breathless immediately contact the hospital again if necessary then go to the hospital 6 minute walk you become breathless go to the hospital so then if the day peep if the if the doctor says admit then get admitted and it is safe to use tam if antivirals in pregnancy tamiflu is safe semdesivir is safe so whatever doctor tells remember 
negative. I am going to become all right. I am going to be fine. So be positive and listen to the doctor. Eat well and then follow the prescription. Then everything is going to be fine. And get vaccinated in pregnancy and lactation. That is the most important thing. Don't allow the infection to come. Get vaccinated and save yourself. Wear the mask. Do the social distancing. Ma'am, uh, then the next uh, question says that if I take both doses of vaccine and then plan my preg pregnancy that month, for how long the effect will last and uh, will keep me safe? It is safe as of today till now. We are not talking about booster. So it will only time should tell after six months do we need or after one year do we need. As of now, we are not talking about booster at all because the booster is needed. See, first dose of thing will give you antibodies. Second dose will take it to a different level and keep it there. Is it keeping it there or are they coming down? Only time will tell when we start doing testing after six months how many antibodies are left. At every given time, we want them to be above the threshold levels. So if they're above threshold level, we don't need. As of today, we are thinking minimum one year that is definitely safe. Okay, so yeah, we have a lot of uh, our queries uh, solved here. Now that we are also uh, having our campaign called Red Dot, so uh, I would like you to throw some light on the issue of uh, menstrual hygiene. And what tips would you like to uh, give to the youth especially? See, menstrual hygiene goes a long way. Why is it very important? Because the uterus is very nearer to the exterior from through which the menstrual blood comes out. So if we don't take care of it, any infection which is there can go up, just the way how the sperm goes up. And we have to also understand that any sanitary napkins which we are using are directly exposed to the uterus. Uh, which is uh, it, it will become any blood which is getting coagulated there can become a media for the infection which can grow. So saying that, let me say how many hours like how do we maintain the pubic and uh, pubic hair and everything. The first thing not necessary shave because urine infections can come from the hair follicle. So trimming of the pubic hair is what is advisable and keeping the milieu there normal. And um, that is having a um, um, pH level which is to be maintained. So you now you have a pH balancers which are available right now. You can use them as a wash there. That is one thing. The second thing which is very, very important is that um, uh, how long can a sanitary napkin be put? Now, every six to eight hours, if you can change the sanitary napkin, that goes a long way in the menstrual hygiene. And uh, the third thing would be what sort of sanitary napkins are we going to use? Never use sanitary napkins which are having plastics inside that. Use an organic sanitary napkin which goes a long way again. Because the, uh, the, um, there is something called as endocrine disrupting chemicals. They get produced from the plastics and thus endocrine disrupting chemicals, which when get, getting absorbed, will lead to many diseases, including cancers, endometriosis and all that. So if we don't take care of that, in the long run, there is an increase in risk of endometriosis, fibroids and cancers and immunosuppressant diseases only because of this. So all of you out there, take care of your menstrual hygiene. Always carry a sanitary napkin inside your purse so that you have it in everything. Whenever you feel there is a sudden onset of menstrual cycle, you always are safe. And then please use organic sanitary napkins. Trim the pubic area and try changing the sanitary napkins every six to eight hours and use a pH balancers to wash in that area so that you can uh, you do, will not have regular infections. And remember, in our body, there's always a normal amount of bacteria, ecoflora, what we call it, it means a normal flora are there, which is made up of fungus, bacteria. Now, don't try to put your finger inside the vagina and clean. There's a, vagina is a self-cleansing organism. Just clean the outside. Don't try to um, uh, me um, uh, mess with the lining of the vaginal wall. Yes, ma'am. And when we are talking about uh, menstrual hygiene, uh, at the same time, we know that there are uh, many girls who miss their schools and uh, their education is not uh, not complete uh, due to this. And uh, they, and the role of parents is essential in that case. So what message would you like to give to the parents out there? I just want to tell the parents that please 
make it a normal normalize the menstrual cycle and the uh, olden days people kids were put to the side in the menstrual cycle days only because uh, there were no uh, proper way of uh, sanitary napkins and incinerating the uh, throwing away the sanitary napkins properly now you have schools where very clearly sanitary napkins are available dispersing systems are uh, available everything is there now the uh, education is being given to the kids where again the washrooms are there in every school how to take care of themselves and uh, separate washrooms for the girls and the boys and when we talk and normalize it and buy the thing uh, buy the sanitary napkins themselves and give it to the daughter and talk that makes them um, not being ashamed of what is normal so i think the parents have to start the discussion and conversation that goes a long way yes ma'am and it's truly uh, empowering to hear that from you and uh, now we have a very uh, enthusiastic audience too and we have a lot of questions coming in from them so uh, there's this question ma'am i took my second dose of cervical vaccine 3 days back so can i take my covid vaccine after 2 weeks yes after 2 weeks a gap between two different vaccines should be 2 weeks i would have preferred you to postpone cervical cancer vaccine and take covid now in the pandemic because in when in, when the pandemic comes the priority is always pandemic and the survival so please all of you out there first take your covid vaccine then any other vaccine after 2 weeks uh the next question says uh, is it safe to have kids when i have pcos Yes, there is nothing. In fact, PCOS. One of the treatment is if somebody who wants to conceive get get uh, uh, induction of ovulation and see that you become pregnant because it's hormonal imbalance and pregnancy gets back usually the hormonal balance back to normal. So if you want to conceive, just it. But it is your choice. Let, let that not be the way to treat it. But it should be your a girl should have a choice. about the time of conception versus time of uh, uh, having a child no child should be an unwanted child never should be it be a burden on you so you plan your life that you uh, if you don't want to have a child talk to your doctor they'll give you a hormonal tablet which will keep pcos under control the minute you are ready for the child then definitely go ahead take the medication if necessary and have a child um the next question is uh, saying that is clot in uh, menstrual blood a danger no it's not a danger clot is not danger but why is there a clot if it is usually menstrual blood do not clot if it is clotting it is more than what your body can take means you are going in for anemia means your hemoglobin is going to fall down if your anemia is going to be severe and you are not uh, uh, targeting that reason why it is bleeding more then when it comes less than severe anemia less than 5 it starts affecting the whole system in your body including the heart failure can happen so if it's anemia that means you are bleeding more and if the clots are there that means you are bleeding more why are you bleeding more is there a organic lesion like fibroid or endometriosis or something like that or polyp or any growth or is it a hormonal imbalance so we need to know there are so many reasons what we call it as polyps or uh, ovulatory problem or endometriotic pro problem or adenomyosis fibroid malignancies you know co coagulatory problems we call it as palm coin so so many reasons for why bleeding is more so find out the reason target it treat it that is what is important testing and then treating then no it's not a problem uh ma'am i think you are also able to see the questions which are there uh, from the audience how they are saying see one is any allergies please just go and take vaccine nothing to be but unless you are known allergy to any of the ingredient of the vaccine anybody can take ma'am and your vaccinations are giving going to be given in the hospital so they'll be ready also if anything happens but just go and another interesting question is here what is the normal time frame to start periods post delivery if you are uh, lactating it can go up to 6 months 9 months also don't worry and if you are having pcos before it comes back later and you are putting on weight and you are not losing again it can be late but if you are not you are not lactating then as early as 33 days you can get your um menstrual cycle within within your 42 days 33 days you can ovulate and you can become pregnant also so if you want to some gap immediately after delivery also you can use a contraception so that's a very important thing 
and there's a one more question i'm seeing um what this is a, which is a myth my friend's doctor told her not to take vaccine as crp is more than which is not true crp is inflammatory marker it is so many things it not need not be oh, oh please confirm if it's not covid go and take a vaccine and what is blighted ovum blighted ovum is something where the pregnancy is not healthy in the sense uh, there is no baby which is formed there is a, a fertilization has happened but the baby has not formed so the pregnancy which is forming will not show a fetus and it dies by itself that is called blighted ovum is a type of the abortion so these are the questions i can see from here and um, one more so one more uh, situation based question yeah. on uh, a person asking about wife not knowing she is 3 to 4 week pregnant and she is tested positive and they have taken a uh, certain uh, uh, things like uh, evermectin and uh, some others may, uh, are also mentioned and they are worried about their baby no need I to worry everything is safe ciprofloxacin is safe just don't worry only doxycycline also now it is meeting that it is safe in pregnancy your pre- embryo is very resistant so till it is 6 weeks usually nothing much happens to the baby just continue nothing to be worried so the test which we do when somebody is bleeding more is first one complete blood picture one thyroid and ultrasound pelvis and from there we take it okay i think we finished our questionnaire plus the half an hour time yes ma'am but uh, still we have a lot of questions to be addressed <laughs> so um, i'd like to ask uh, one question uh, that is based on the symptoms of vaginal uh, infection and how can we overcome that see the white discharge first thing people have to understand is what is normal white discharge and what is abnormal white discharge white discharge has a aroma or a smell of its own so don't get paranoid okay just like how ice water ear nose waters and ear waters mouth waters the jana also has secretions which will be there which might be mucoid which is sticky which can be little watery or little altered color that's all normal just before periods or in between when you're ovulating during pregnancy all this is normal white discharge so then what is abnormal white discharge it only starts usually after any insertion that is after intercourse or something like that and any white discharge which is itchy which is foul smelling greenish or curdy white or blood stained or if it causes a fishy smell or anything so these are the white discharge then when you which you have to go and meet a doctor they will examine see what is the infection and then treat so one point we should tell about this is this both the partners should be treated otherwise the woman is not getting treated properly when we were talking about hpv infection that is what is important recurrent repeated infections are the ones which causes all the problems so if the man is not treated just because he doesn't have symptoms she is going to get recurrent repeated infections so both the partners should be treated before the next intercourse then we can treat the complete vaginal infections and cervical infections okay yes ma'am absolutely and um, uh, now we have a little uh, fun uh, section for you which is called myth or fact so uh, uh, so the first statement is uh, that uh, premenstrual syndrome is exaggerated and it is all in the head no it is a now, fact is it a myth or a fact it's a fact it's no i mean to say pms is a fact it is not exaggerated it's not in the head premenstrual syndrome exists okay it is a reality it is because of deficiencies and hormonal imbalance so if pms is there it can be treated this is one condition most of the time is 100% curable go to your doctor take your multivitamins and take your dietary changes and hormones if necessary the second statement is that uh, you should avoid all the sports activities uh, like exercise and uh, swimming during periods myth you can do exercises you can go swimming and uh, so on this note i'd like to uh, ask you to give a con- concluding message to all our audience uh, who has been there and it was lovely to have you i feel pleasure is mine my concluding would be all please girls guys everybody out there love yourself take care of yourself and please all get vaccinated and be safe and don't forget to live life after life that is donate your organs 
Thank you so much, ma'am. It was really insightful and great to have you.